I was first told about this panel. It was called Luxury and Fashion 2.0. But I saw when I looked at the program this morning that it had been changed to fashion. So I guess someone is updating our reality uh, as we speak. I actually, I was glad they changed it because I think it, um, it makes more sense. At this stage in the game, there are certain truths I think that we all take to be self-evident. And if you've heard that statement before, it's because I took it from the Declaration of Independence. Um, but anyway, the first one is that people will spend money, quite a lot of money, Natalie, online. The second is that consumers want to interact with brands, whether via Facebook or Twitter or Polyvore, which leaves us with number? Anyone? Comes after two? Three, thank you. <laughs> leaves us with what I would call fashion 3.0, which is once you've got the crowd, what do you do with them? How do you take all those people, all that communication, and convert it into revenue? How do you wade into the messy, opinionated world of online democracy as a fashion brand? And perhaps more importantly, how much independence do you pay or how much credence do you give to what the crowd thinks? Uh, to me, this is what's going to shape up to be the next great battle in the fashion world. And to illustrate that, um, I want to tell you a story about a story I wrote about a designer called Rebecca Minkoff, who is a, an American handbag designer who decided um, a couple weeks ago to have a competition on Polyvore where she invited anyone who wanted to to design a handbag for her using a couple of components. And of the thousands of designs that, she, that were submitted, she picked 10. And she posted those 10 on Facebook and invited her fans to pick the winner. And the winning bag, which was by F21 Obsessed, is going to be produced, shown at New York Fashion Week, and sold in Rebecca's stores. And after I wrote about this, uh, I got a couple comments from readers, one of which said, as a creative director myself, the notion of design by committee is not a successful strategy. Extending that out to crowdsourcing framework is beset with potential disasters. Too many cooks. And why would someone want to buy a $595 bag created by a neighbor and chosen on Facebook? I wouldn't. That was followed by, sorry. Just because someone is your neighbor doesn't mean they aren't talented. Discovering a designer online is the same as discovering a designer at Parsons, except online your potential reach is greater, which increases the chances you'll discover the next Alexander McQueen, Mark Jacobs, or Rebecca Minkoff. Everyone that matters, matters online first. If we are trapped by the mindset you've put in place where good design can only come from the mind of a creative director, we'd fail to evolve and we'd be stuck in a box devoid of true collective creativity. So there you go. Anyway, to look, help us look at the issues and the gulf between these two uh, sides, we have three very distinguished panelists, one of whom has already been introduced at great length, so I won't <laughs> go into that. But on my left, we have Margarita Vandenbosch, who's the creative advisor of H&M, the High Street Megalith, and a woman who was instrumental in turning that brand into one of the most fashion-forward, fast fashion brands probably on the planet, and who a few weeks ago announced the latest and possibly most interesting in a series of limited collaborations the brand has been doing with outside designers which is a niche collection of nine pieces designed by a Swedish blogger called Ellen King. Next to her is Scott Galloway, a professor of marketing at the New York University's Stern School of Business and the founder of the think tank L2, which looks specifically at the relationship between industries and the digital world, and recently published a digital IQ ranking of various fashion brands looking at their progress or lack of it, I think you would say, online. So, Margarita, I want to start by asking you about the strategy and the thinking behind working with Ellen King and what you hope to achieve with it. Uh, we, we, we thought it was fun to, to pick up this Ellen King, who is in Sweden a very popular blogger and uh, have a lot of interest in her personality and she also have a lot of seasonal sense of style. 
So we decided to do a small collection with her. We didn't understand that it should be such an attention in the whole world because it, it has in, in our other, this will be only for Sweden because we think even if we are a global company, it could be nice to do something more local. And, uh, but it has been a very nice collection, but it will only be, so, be sold in Sweden. Anyway, she came up to us. Of course, we have our designer, pattern maker, and, uh, and buyer. But she also presented. She's not really unprofessional because she had made boards, colors, and silhouettes. She knew exactly what she wanted to do. And um, it became a really nice collaboration. And uh, we are really happy to be maybe the first company who they made the collection with a blogger, I think. But normally, of course, we have a design team, you know, working 150 designers, I think, in-house. And, and uh, we have our famous collaborations with um, designers, so we do. But we are very customer-focused, and I think where the customer are and where the interest is, I mean, we want to be also. And uh, I think these uh, new techniques and these new, new kind of informations have... Uh, it has been a completely different world in fashion. And I think we are open-minded and we want to, to follow, follow that also. Natalie, what do you think of that? Would you, can you imagine selling a brand by a blogger at some point? Sure. Um, I think, uh, well, first of all, we scour the world for talent. Um, but if uh, somebody is a blogger or a designer um, and they produce great product, uh, why not? Um, I think... Uh, for us, it has to be relevant as a, as a fashion product. But um, a lot of the designers that we sell started off life not as designers, and we offered them a global um, stockist ability and exposure. And as it turns out, a consumer who's spending a couple thousand pounds on a dress by Marc Jacobs is also very happy to spend money on an unknown designer as long as it's been vetted. Um, and can the vetting happen through a crowd or by an individual? Yes. Um, I think you can have more extremes from individuals. The, the crowd will probably bring out the average. But I think it's in, for us, it's important to still curate that crowd in a sort of American Idol kind of way. But uh, no, I think it's great. And, and Scott, is this something that you could see happening in the future, that brands would actually reach out to consumers this way? I think they're reaching out, right? Well, first off, thank you, Berta Media. My, my wife was born and raised in Munich, and it's just wonderful to be here. So thank you. Thank you for having us. I think there's different stages. I think the first stage is, is user-generated or use of the social graph around marketing. So empowering your power users, if you will, to get out there and spread the word. I, how many of you have heard of a woman named Michelle Phan? Anybody? I think Michelle Phan is the Michael Jordan of our generation, that she's going to revolutionize marketing. She's a 24-year-old Vietnamese-American woman who does videos on how to apply makeup. And 12 of the top 15 how-to videos on YouTube are how to apply makeup. And this young woman started doing these videos, and 12 of the 15 um, that she's done have, have garnered over 20 million views. So when you look at the, the kind of expense these brands are going through to reach out and interrupt people via traditional, traditional broadcast medium, and then you have your power user going out, and when she's authentic and doing something interesting, uh, people are raising their hand and watching this video 23 million times. That next step is going to be kind of crowdsourced marketing. In terms of crowdsourced merchandising, I think it's a long way between what you're talking about, which Threadless does. Threadless has people nominate designs, and then the winner gets their shirt produced. To uh, the majority of us, still want to look to the to the curators who have a stronger voice, a stronger sense of fashion to help us cut through the noise and save us time. So I, I, I think that leap takes goes to marketing. I think it's a long time before it goes to merchandising. But I think if, if the customer's uh, interest um, gain uh, and, and they want to be more active, I think it's something good for us also. I think it's something that we should embrace because they will also be more and more interested in clothes and fashion. And, and uh, you only have to, to follow that. And, uh, and to try to, to find different way of attracting them? I mean, I think tr traditional uh, retail rules are that, um, you know, your, your crowdsourcing is how well your product sells. 
And so that sort of dictates what your, the stores buy and then sell again. I was actually reading an interesting um, interview that you did, Vanessa, with uh, Tamara Mellon and the FT, uh, which talked about uh, the Jimmy Choo collaboration with H&M, yeah. and that uh, they actually use that as a platform for testing menswear, beauty, shoes, kids. They put out every product, which they never do, and then they waited and see, did it sell? And as it turned out, it sold. So they used it as a sort of uh, customer research. And now that has helped shape her strategy for her business. Oh, well, I mean, I think one of the um, issues is what this does to the traditional equation. Because for a long time, it was one of the basic tenets of the fashion world that the fashion companies and their designers led consumers. That they were creating something that people didn't know they wanted, which was why they would buy it. If you look to consumers to lead you, what does that mean? I think you have to do both. Of course, you have to create things that you don't, don't this to surprise them and that they don't know that they want and so on. But you still also have to, to listen to them and see what are, the, what are their inspiration today, what are they doing, what, and, and so on. You have to follow them. You have to do both way, I think. I think um, uh, customization is sort of a halfway point for, for fashion merchandising, at least. Um, allowing the consumer to go back into the archives of collections and reorder things. And if you offer it to a global audience, which the internet can allow you, because it can speak to millions of people simultaneously, um, you can connect the the designer or the product with the customer to understand what kind of demand there is for product, um, but also how you want that product to look. Um, Burberry are, are launching an amazing initiative where they are offering something like 2,000 variations uh, to the consumer to personalize your own trench coat. And presumably, once somebody designs a trench coat with a lining which you like and a different color sleeve that you like, you'll also be able to shop from maybe somebody in Wyoming will have designed that great code and you'll be able to shop from it. Um, what becomes interesting for the manufacturers is that if enough people place orders on those items, um, you end up getting a better margin, you can manufacture more of them. Um, it's an amazing tool for business. It's an amazing tool for customers to get them what they want. Um, and personally, I'm super excited about whatever's gonna come out of it. Um, does that though, transform a designer from a creator into an editor? Um, no, I think uh, what you said is the designer still has to come up with newness, um, and then, but you still have to listen to your customer. Um, and sometimes uh, it's good to stick to your guns as well and say, I don't, I don't believe in that, and I'm going to withhold it. I mean, there is still the law of supply and demand. If you produce too much of um, something that everybody wants, the price goes down. Um, so again, it's back to your point about marketing. Yeah, there's, if, if you were to look at companies through the 90s that had a disproportionate return to shareholders, a lot of people would describe those companies as being very consumer driven, and that is figuring out unique ways, um, like the ones you're talking about, to listen to their consumers and crowdsource ideas. But I think the data shows that over the last 10 years, the majority of disproportionate market value has been created by people that not only aren't consumer driven, but have a belief that they have a better sense for where the consumer wants to go than the consumer themselves. L Steve, Jobs, yeah. Steve Jobs sacrifices consumer preferences for design. Uh, Howard Lester, who recently passed away, understood that Americans wanted French cookware. Mickey Drexler, no one told him that people wanted fashion, basics, and color. At the end of the day, anybody here who's, who's added an extraordinary amount of shareholder value, you can almost always reverse engineer it to someone who looks at the data and then primarily ignores it and goes with their gut because they have a vision for something wonderful. But I also, I also have to say, um, I think it's very important to, to also understand that you need design and pattern cutters that it also technique and things that the customers never can make. I mean, you always need the, the people who know, know the things. Because um, also with this, all these celebrity collaborations, it, you can make, maybe you can make people think that anybody can make a design. And, and that is, of course, also wrong in a way. Because even if someone wants to make it, you, have, you always need the designer. You always need a pattern maker. You always need somebody to produce it. That, that they have to be professionals, all of them. Yeah, we were um, talking in the car earlier today about when you um, let the consumer into the give them the buying power directly to the uh, designer. 
they end up holding the risk. So um, what happens if the crowdsourced product gets delivered to the crowd and they're not happy with the product and they want to return it? Um, all of a sudden, what the middleman was holding in terms of managing the risk and merchandising and planning is going to the consumer. I'm not sure that the consumer's ready for that. They, they'd love to have things the way they want it, but they also want to be able to have somebody manage that for them, if you know what I mean. They have to have someone who take care about their ideas, definitely. So, so what's the best way to use this new resource? You know, is it as a kind of marketing relationship? Is it as a talent search? Is it to create product? Is it, is it for production purposes? For testing how many people actually like something and then changing your orders accordingly? I mean, I think it's like anything in life. You know, If you can talk to as many people as you can and ask their advice, um, listen, and then use your own common sense to make a decision, um, it's an educated decision. And, you, and it, for every business, that's a very powerful tool. I mean, the internet has given us that gift to be able to uh, have a, d a dialogue with, with our customers, with our audience. Um, and, um, but it's still, uh, to your point, up to the individual leaders to either go with that or to differ. Um, I mean, I personally like to go, you know, if, some, if everybody is turning left, I like to turn right because then there are fewer people in that space. I think you always have to listen to the customer. I think people have done that all the time, but maybe now it is more, you do it in a, in a different way maybe. But uh, I think every company is looking at what they sell last year, and what, 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 what they have like their, their key items and key issues. Every, every company have that, I think. It's, it's also a matter of degree. We look at the high, 100, 100 most iconic brands in fashion and luxury and then rank their, their digital IQ. And if you look at the ones that quote unquote don't get it that are in the feeble and challenge categories, which are actually clinical terms to describe people with low IQs, they aren't selling. So watch and jewelry companies, it's difficult to find one single luxury watch company that's selling online, much less crowdsourcing. And, I, and to use Kara's term, I think it's largely because it's, these companies are typically controlled by a series of old white men who are just sort of hoping the internet will go away. And then you have kind of the second stage, the second big cultural shift is actually interacting with people with, via social media. The majority of companies in fashion and luxury, they think of social media really as a one-way broadcast medium, but they're not really listening. They, they, they have so much fear around someone. You, you hear terms in the boardrooms of luxury brands, people saying, talking about proximity to the consumer or scarcity or promise for basically as an excuse for not to sell online or not to speak to them with any sort of voice. And what they're really saying is it's Latin for, I don't get this stuff and it scares me. When you look at the new consumer, you look at the fact that, you know, how digitally native this, up, this new wealth is, if you're not selling online, you're leaving out your, you know, your greatest sales channel. And I mean, there are a dramatic number of companies not online. Look at user reviews. You do user reviews, correct? Do you guys do user reviews at H&M? We have uh, been online for a long time, yeah. There's only one luxury brand doing user reviews right now, and it's the Poppy brand, which is a sub-brand of Coach. User reviews are the fastest way to pop your sales, 18 to 15% within 90 days if you're an e-commerce site. They bring a certain viscosity and circulatory flow to the brand, and everyone's so worried about someone saying ne something negative about their brand, and typically what you find is, is that the community itself polices it and governs it. And the few negative comments you get give credence to the positive comments, which increases yield, conversion, average order size, so before we even start to talk about, I think, crowdsourcing merchandising, luxury and fashion, there's several baby steps that haven't been taken yet. But think of it a different way. Do you, is it possible that in order to avoid an interaction that is scary, i.e. somebody being able to say, hey, that bag is bad, I don't like it, brands are creating outreach through competitions and, in fact, product to create a sense of communication which is not, in fact, real communication. Yeah, but, but that's exactly the point. I think negative reviews, if, if you're getting more than 30% negative reviews on your site, you have bigger problems, right? But 100% positive reviews are having no user reviews. Your sales are actually X. And Sha Yang, a colleague at Stern, actually did some research here. But when your negative reviews are between 5 and 15%, sales actually go up. 
because it gives credibility to the, neg to the positive reviews. So the notion that you can control it, there are user reviews taking place on every product, every magazine, everything anyone, any large company does in this room. It's just that if you don't have user reviews on your site, you don't have a seat at the table. You aren't shaping those user reviews. User reviews happen. The consumer always wins. He or she will review that Hermes scarf or, or how you're doing in terms of customer delivery. It's just whether or, want, whether or not you're going to be part of the conversation. And do you think there's a difference, Margarita, between doing this on the mass market side of things and doing it at the sort of the high-end brands that you deal with, Natalie? Um, no, I don't think there's any difference. I'd like to just correct, because you asked me if we have user reviews on the site. We don't. Um, we have it on our Facebook page um, and through Twitter. And um, our product app doesn't sit around on the shelves long enough to even have it validated. I think if we had product that was there year-round, we'd want to put that on there. Um, no, I think it's, it, I mean, as you said, it is happening online, whether you like it or not. And it's, um, it's an extraordinary tool for luxury brands to be able to listen to what's being said about their product. Um, I think the problem is too many companies say they listen and then they don't do anything about it. I think it's probably the same for, for because also the customers is looking at every, they can look at all fashion on the internet, you know, it's not only what they can afford, so they look at everything and follow everything. Who is fashion, uh, fashionista? You know. so, so where is this going? How, how close, you know, how much do you want to be involved in a conversation about product with your, cu your customers? I think that's very interesting. Um, Would you do more blogger um, lines? You mean me personally? Maybe I don't have that. But I think all my colleagues and people, we, we are also on Facebook and we have uh, bloggers and we, we are very active. I, you can't say it, but by me personally, I'm not. But I think it's interesting and I think it's also it's something that we have to do with the company, you know, to, 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 follow, to, to follow this kind of media. It's very interesting, I think. Um, well, we're, we have active plans uh, to use our users um, to help um, market the product. Um, I don't know if we want to show uh, a sneak peek. There's a slide up here on the left screen. I don't know if we can get it up on the screen. Um, but we're launching something called net Porte Live. Um, yeah, and this is a screen grab. Um, and at any time, uh, customers from all over the world will be able to log on, click on live, see how many users are online at the time, um, what people are putting in their baskets, wish list, telling a friend about um, in real time. Um, and this we have big plans for because the minute you'll be able to start tracking different users around the world and what they're buying and what they like. Um, how stylish they are, and we're going to hopefully make a conversation between our users so that they can start getting advice from each other. We still are the first editors of the product that gets on the site, but you may start listening to other people around the world about what's important, and it's a very compelling sales tool, and it's coming, it's completely transparent, it lets the, the customers see what other people are liking, um, and, it's, and because it's global, it gives an amazing snapshot of what's happening. So we're really excited about that. And what do you, what do you think, Scott? How, how, how far is this going to go? Crowdsourcing? Well, again, I, I think that there will be pockets of crowdsourcing around merchandising. But the heuristic is uh, the user reviews, which I guess is a, is a former synonym for crowdsourcing, is going to play an, an increasingly important role in, in fashion and luxury marketing. I mean, look at it. Burberry now has 3.5 million likes. Gucci's at 3.4 million. The global circulation of Cosmopolitan, Vogue, and Vanity Fair are 2.2 million, 1.2, and 1.1 million, respectively. Those global circulations grew by 1% last year. Those likes on Facebook grew 247% last year. So it's, think about this. It's likely that in 18 months, Burberry will have 10 million people who've raised their hand and said, I want to have a direct relationship with you. And when you think about it, there's about to be a massive reallocation of both human, financial, creative, and intellectual capital that's going to go to these brands trying to figure out their own content, this notion of brands as media companies. And they're going to start, in my opinion, reducing the amount of investment that they're, they're making in quote unquote interruption marketing. Or in other words, a lot of great brands who are embracing these mediums are going to have the luxury of excising the publisher's tax. Or put another way, 
advertising moving forward and luxury and watches and maybe the tax the mediocre brands have to pay moving forward. Okay, well, I think we have time. Do you want to? I was just thinking about the, all the brands that we worked with with the collaborations. They always thought it was so nice to have a bigger audience for a while, and that is a little bit um, was very challenging for them. That's what everybody said. But you controlled it. That's why they trusted you to control the bigger audience. They, I think they'd be scared to do it themselves. I think it, I don't know why they, think, they could have done it themselves, of course, <laughs> but they haven't. <laughs> Okay, I think we have some time. If there are any questions for the panelists, sir, front. So I, uh, we have a company, Howard Morgan. We have a company called Mod Cloth in the U.S. that's also doing crowdsource with retro clothing, getting quite big. And what they've found is that they really help the manufacturers because you're really helping downstream in terms of demand prediction. Uh, do you see that happening with the big brands, which typically push stuff out there and then end up having to, to sell it on the various uh, uh, you know, re remainder sites, as it were? I think that was more of a statement. <laughs> <laughs> so you asked what big brands are kind of reverse using it to supply chain advance. The, the, the best example right now is what Burberry is doing, and that is, E-commerce sales used to be an afterthought in the supply chain. You see what sold in the stores, most specifically what didn't sell, and you threw it on the internet. Whereas Burberry is doing shoppable video of their fashion shows. And finally, it's happening. Remember, the kind of the brave new world that we were running around in the valley trying to uh, tell people. It's like what Bill Gates said, stuff that takes three years takes 10 years. It's actually happening now. So you can do, on Burberry's website, a shoppable video live from the runway show, stop the video and buy something. They're now using that data to mandate the supply chain or the product that's going to go into their store. So they're the first, as far as I know, they're the first fashion brand where the tail is wagging the dog, where e-commerce is the, is the tip, of the, tip of the spear for the supply chain. Okay, is there another question? Yeah, to Natalie Massanat. Um, given that you're starting Mr. Porte now, we were wondering what's the crucial challenge to get men to shop on the web compared to how women shop? Um, Oh, wow. Well, first of all, tell them about that we exist. Um, uh, well, men are very different when it comes to, to shopping. Um, from what I understand, um, you're not driven by trends as, as, as women are. You stick to the things that you know, that you like. You're inspired by the, your peer group, your uniform. If you're an entrepreneur, you have a certain way of dressing. If you're an investment banker, you have a certain way of dressing. I think real men inspire you, um, uh, not fashion, 18-year-old fashion models. Um, so we've had to completely change the way that we think about selling fashion. Um, and we also know that repeat purchases are going to be very important. Um, men want to be able to come back and buy the same thing over and over again. Um, so with Net-A-Porte, we had the advantage of newness, of things changing all the time to sell product. Here, I think it will be service-focused. Um, ease focused, it will be systematized, it will be clean, it will be logical, um, and uh, the way that men think. Um, I think, I don't think there's been a way yet invented that the way that men would like to shop, and I think online will be the way that men like to shop, because I don't know that many men who like to troll through a perfume and lingerie department to get themselves to the men's department to then have somebody they've never met tell them they should try on a pair of skinny jeans. So, uh, I must say something. I think it's a generation question also when it comes to men, because I see younger men, they can have a little bit the same attitude as women, and they look for something, they want to find that peace and so on. It, it's, I think it's uh, changing a bit also. Yeah, you're right. Um, but I, we're hoping to talk to um, all generations. Yeah.